Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome our online audiences and also those who watch later on YouTube or Facebook. And it's my great pleasure to have Mark Shaw back again. This is the third time he's come to the Commonwealth Club with his research. Uh, first, he did a book on Dorothy Kilgallen. Well, he'd done some earlier books on the Kennedys. Then he did a book on the mysterious death of Dorothy Kilgallen, and then he put it together in another book with, on denial of justice. And as a result of a large number of people who read those books suggesting that he researched Marilyn Monroe's death, um, he's done another book called Collateral Damage. Uh, you're going to find it very interesting. So, Mark, welcome back to the Commonwealth Club, this time virtually from Santa Clara. Uh, thanks for joining us this way. Thank you, George. It's a real honor again. And, uh, uh, I think I've told you just uh, the fact that I never was going to write Collateral Damage, but this is my contribution to history, really. I don't think there's ever been a book written like this. In fact, I know that there hasn't. Uh, what I've tried to do in the new book is to resolve three of the most, uh, you know, uh, important uh, true crime murder mysteries, uh, I would say, of the 20th century, uh, having to do with Marilyn Monroe, uh, JFK, and Dorothy Kilgallen. And this book, as you see, as you said, was a, you know, a follow-up. Uh, to the three books that I'd written uh, that, that touched on the JFK assassination and Dorothy Kilgallen as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, you, you, first of all, I, I think it'd be great to tell one story first before we get into those um, stories that we have for today about those three um, mysterious and really awful murders. Um, and that is that you, you have some personal experience uh, that relates to this you, you were, as a young reporter, you worked for Good Morning America in Philadelphia. And, and why don't you just tell the story? It's in your book. But Well, if we can uh, post the three books there, uh, you know, The Poison Patriarch, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, who be which became a bestseller, and Denial of Justice on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can tell you that uh, they're all a result, especially The Poison Patriarch, mm -hmm. of, uh, of an investigation that I was doing at the time. I, I was a former criminal defense lawyer, and I uh, moved to Colorado. In fact, F. Lee Bailey, who uh, died recently, I tried a case or two with him. And uh, then, uh, you know, when I when I moved out to Colorado, uh, he, he couldn't cover a, a trial called the Claudine Langer case when she shot the skier cyber uh, spider savage. And so he referred me to Good Morning America to do that. And then I became kind of a legal correspondent for them. Uh -huh. they, they sent me to uh, to Philadelphia because there was a mafia a lawyer there who said he would talk to me. And we were kind of surprised at that, but off I went and I went to his office and I interviewed him and I was surprised at what he told me about their uh, trying to get their, uh, their hands into to Atlantic city, the gambling and everything. So oh. next day uh, that, that aired on good morning America. And uh, that was a huge hit. And so the producer said, well, will he talk to you again, Mark? Mm -hmm. So I uh, got on the phone and I called his office and uh, when I did, there was a secretary, I guess, who came on the line. I said, I want to talk to Mr. So-and-so. Uh, -and, -so. and she, a lot of silence. And then she came back on and I said, are you OK? And she said, well, Mr. Shaw, I don't know if uh, you know it or not. Apparently you don't. But when he started his car this morning, it blew up. Huh. So uh, that let me know that you've got to be very, very careful. And that kind of leads into the poison patriarch because mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I had done a book on, uh, written a book and published it on Melvin Belli, who mm -hmm. I knew in the 1980s, uh, practiced law a little bit with him in San Francisco, and he became Jack Ruby's lawyer. And so that, that, uh, that he book... Became, he was Jack Ruby's lawyer before you, before you started working for him. Uh, uh, working with him, yeah. Yeah, before you started working with him. He had, he had, he had been uh, Jack Ruby's lawyer 15 years earlier or so. That's right. Right, okay. But uh, what I found out that Bill, I was a real mafia aficionado. He mm -hmm. loved the mafia, and they loved him, and he was kind of that way. And so... 
Once I, I uh, was inquisitive with my investigative mind of why Ruby, or excuse me, why Belli became Ruby's lawyer mm-hmm. because he never tried a criminal case in his life, <laughs> I wonder where the mafia could be involved in the JFK assassination. And so I can kind of quickly take you through that journey because I wrote The Poison Patriarch with a new way of looking at the JFK assassination. And that was why Bobby Kennedy was not killed. Uh, instead of why JFK was. And I found out that Bobby's enemies were responsible for the JFK assassination. People can read more about that in, in Collateral Damage. But uh, basically what I, what I was able to do then was to really give people a different perspective of the, of the JFK assassination. And then that led me to this incredibly remarkable uh, investigative reporter, although she was known for other things at the time, Dorothy Kilgallen. Mm-hmm. And you're may remember her as a as a uh, uh, celebrity on what's my line television show on cbs but she was more than that uh, she was uh, one of the finest uh, investigative reporters that ever lived she covered the jack uh, she covered the jack ruby trial which, which we can talk about and she uh, was the only one to interview jack ruby but before that the uh, the uh, uh, Lindbergh baby kidnapping case the dr sam shepherd case and all of that and so I began to be interested in whether Dorothy had written about the JFK assassination. And uh, that really led me. She kind of guided me to the columns she'd written when she was actually in Dallas. And the first one was one called The Oswald File Must Not Close. Mm-hmm. So while everybody was going in the direction of what J. Edgar Hoover said happened with Oswald alone and all of that, which we've proved to be ludicrous, Dorothy was going the, uh, the other way. She didn't believe that that Ruby had, uh, you know, by himself or, or, or Oswald by himself had killed JFK. And so she began looking at at uh, Jack Ruby. Um, and I, Mark, I, one, I, one little uh, aside here. Um, you mentioned that that uh, Dorothy was the only one that actually got to interview Jack Ruby. I think it should be explained to the audience that she was something like the Barbara Walters or something that she was herself so famous that people wanted to do things with her because she had all these different media things that she was doing. And I think that, that that's why she got the nod and, and got the inside track on so many things. Uh, as you say in the book, she was sometimes the bigger, biggest celebrity at a trial that was a celebrity trial. So, I'll show you this, and, and people may not be able to, to really see it too well, but they can see it in collateral damage. That's Dorothy at the Dr. Sam Shepard case mm-hmm. in the room. All of the other reporters are, are gathered around her. They had such respect for her. She, she had a great deal of in, integrity in terms of what she did. And, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, she, she, she knew JFK. They were friends. Uh, she had taken her son to the White House to meet him and everything. He was nice to her son. So when he died, it was personal on her, uh, on her to, uh, you know, on her, uh, with her mind, at least. And the New York Post called her the most... Uh, Powerful female voice in America. And mm-hmm. if you can imagine, that was a huge deal at the time in the early 1960s. So uh, Dorothy was remarkable. And like Marilyn Monroe that we'll talk about, I think an incredible inspiration uh, uh, for both the women because they both overcame gender discrimination to get to the top of their respective worlds. This They're, is the older Dorothy, Kennedy brother that died, right? Right. That's Joe. Right. We could say, by the way, with uh, Joe Kennedy, he was a bad guy. And, and he when he couldn't be president himself because he was uh, too nice to Adolf Hitler when he was ambassador to Britain, yeah. he really decided that, uh, OK, uh, when Joe died, his son, young uh, oldest son, uh, he, he would be he couldn't be president himself. So he wanted JFK, then RFK and then Teddy, Teddy Kennedy. He thought there could be 24 years of mm-hmm. Kennedy in the White House. <laughs> and that's going to directly fit into Joe's look at the world and RFK. So let's go to the photograph of Marilyn and Dorothy. That's the Oswald must, fi- must not close. She wrote all of these articles. And uh, we should say right here that um, uh, Dorothy died in uh, November of 1965. I proved in the reporter who knew too much that was because she was too close to the truth, exposing too, clo- uh, too much of the truth uh, in a book she was writing for Random House. And that'll figure back in as we go forward as well. So there's one of my favorite photographs. This is Marilyn and Dorothy. Uh, and let me explain that I was actually never going to write Collateral Damage. Mm-hmm. I had no intention. I'd written the three books about the assassination. Hey, Mark, that's enough. Yeah. People around the world, all of the supporters are more than two million views of my presentations and interviews, including the ones with you up on YouTube. Mm-hmm. I kept getting these emails. Come on, Mark, there must be a connection. 
between Dorothy Kilgallen's death and Marilyn's death. And I finally said, okay, I'm going to look into this. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know if there was or not. And so I started out from ground zero. And the first thing I found was this photograph. And uh, this is on the set of a film called Let's Make Love that Marilyn made with Yves Montan, the French actor. Mm-hmm. And we're at a news conference and there was Dorothy and Marilyn. And so I saw that, and then I kind of kept digging a little bit. And the next one I saw, the next slide, please, was a column that uh, Dorothy wrote about Marilyn, letting me know that she had been quite interested in Marilyn, who had been to her home, to Dorothy's home for parties and things like that. But she wrote about Marilyn, the golden girl, loses third marriage, pursuing love. And what she meant is that Marilyn was married at a very early age, then Joe DiMaggio, the baseball player, and then Arthur Miller, the playwright, those uh, d- marriages didn't work. And so she wrote about, she talks about in there that Marilyn could be like a, a little girl that went to the, the candy store. Mm-hmm. And all these men were after her and everything. She finally picked three, but those relationships didn't work out at all. And so it was most interesting to me to, to, to learn about that. And then I kept thinking in the back of my mind, this whole thing, we should tell the, the audience, George, right now, that mm-hmm. Marilyn... Uh, died on August 2nd, 1962. That will be 59 years next month uh, Mm -hmm. in in August. Uh, She would have been 95 years old if she had lived on on, uh, June the 1st. And and she died and the verdict uh, was called probable suicide. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But once I found out that that Dorothy had written about Marilyn, then the next slide, oh, I want to go to this, the next slide, it's a book called Fragments that I would strongly suggest anybody that wants to know anything about Marilyn Monroe, that they read this book. Mm-hmm. And what it is, is the evidence that Marilyn Monroe was not a dumb blonde. She was not just this sex uh, image at all. She was a smart woman. Uh, mm-hmm. And in that particular book, uh, Fragments, I think you, if you can put it back up on the screen, this is a book that was written, and what it has is all of Marilyn's writings in hotel rooms, on the backs of receipts, all of that. You can read her poetry, what, what her life looked like, uh, what her insight was, and what it, it, it gave me as an investigative reporter as I was trying to go through this journey to see if there was that, what happened to Marilyn, is that it showed to me what was in her mind, what was in her mind in, in uh, early 1962 and leading up to her death and all that. So I'd really suggest that people read that book. There's another one called My Story mm-hmm. that by Marilyn Monroe, actually. And I think both of those books would be beneficial to people for sure. Mm -hmm. So next up was this column that really made me stop and think. I think in any investigative reporter or historian's journey, they come across something that really clicks in their mind that, hey, there's something wrong with, uh, with this verdict of probable suicide. And this was a column called Marilyn Monroe, MM, has Hollywood talking again. And, if, and, and, and you can see it. I think we have that next slide, if you would. I think that's the one before this one. Okay. Can you okay, back up one? It. Can you back up one slide? Yeah, please. There it is. Okay. Yes, okay. So, so what this is, is it's on August 3rd, 1962. When I saw it, I wait a minute. This was written one day before Marilyn died. Mm-hmm. MM has Hollywood talking again, Okay. And what it says is Marilyn Monroe's health must be improving. She's been attending select Hollywood parties and has become the talk of the town again. In, 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 uh, and she's in the, cooking in the sex appeal department, too. She's proved vastly alluring to a handsome, handsome gentleman who is a bigger name than Joe DiMaggio in his heyday. So don't write off Marilyn is finished. So a bigger name than Joe DiMaggio, and she's on the upswing and all of this. Wait a minute, Mark. Is, is this the mentality of a woman who supposedly is going to commit suicide the next day after this column, you know, is mm-hmm. is uh, is printed, is posted by by uh, by Dorothy Kilgallen? And and I think you would have been as a curious man and a man of the truth, George, you would have had the same reaction as I did. Well, it's it's, it's unfortunate because she had uh, what had had a couple of, of uh, problems on the set and so on and so forth for the six months or so before she died. And they, they kind of erased over the last month or two um, mm-hmm. when they presented the story that this was all part of a piece because um, her, her recovery was not included. Um, so, well, so it's yeah, interesting. But, but, yeah. but still, she, she, she seemed to be in good humor. Her, right. her, uh, uh, her um, PR woman said she was in great spirits, her, her masseuse. 
you know, I only use primary sources. I really am careful. I don't speculate. And her her uh, masseur said uh, she looks better than she has in years and all that kind of thing. So, again, the suspicion. But the next slide, if you'll see, is exactly what was reported uh, mm-hmm. to the media. And that one is Marilyn Monroe kills self. So see, please bring that up if you would. All right. uh, the one the next the slide that's past fragments. Yeah, please, if you would. The one right after that. Keep going. Yeah, right. there, there's the headline. OK. And so everybody in the world thought, well, you know, it says uh, famed, uh, found nude in bed, hand on phone, took 40 pills right there without anything else happening. Just as it happened in Dorothy Kilgallen's case, when they when they gave out this wrong uh, uh, medical examiner uh, headline uh, that she had died of an overdose circumstances undetermined, which I've proved time and time again was not the case. So uh, Dorothy was murdered. But, but when this happened, Marilyn Monroe kills self. When that headline came out, her, her reputation was tarnished forever. Mm. Hopefully until now, until I'm presenting all this evidence about her. So that happened. And then I decided, OK, what do I need to do? Well, if one of the first things I did in Dorothy Kilgallen's death was go look at the autopsy, which was very uh, fraudulent, very much botched. Mm. Uh, junior medical examiners and everything. And so I said to myself, I'm going to go look at the autopsy for Marilyn Monroe. So if you pull that up, please, it's the original copy of the Office of the County uh, Coroner. So what does it say? Acute barbiturate poisoning, ingestion of an overdose, an overdose. The next one then. That's at 1030 in the morning, the day after she died. And now we go to the next slide. And that's under the certificate of death. Mm -hmm. About, oh, let's see, seven hours later at 340, they've changed the result to probable suicide. And this was Dr. Thomas Noguchi who handled uh, the autopsy. And it made me really wonder because I'd learned about him when he was involved with uh, the Michael Jackson case and all that. There were always questions about him. Right. Well, that made me wonder. So go back one slide to this column that Mer- uh, that Dorothy wrote about Marilyn. And this is a column she wrote. It, it says Martha proves she's a trooper, but that was about Martha Ray, the actress. But in those paragraphs, uh, just the one at the bottom of the first uh, one and then in the other ones, uh, Dorothy asks all these questions about Marilyn's death. Uh, why was the light on in her bedroom when she slept in the dark? Why was she found in the nude when she didn't sleep in the nude? Why was her doctor and psychiatrist called? And then they said they came there at different times and they consulted. Uh, all of these questions, uh, wait a minute, uh, she died by supposedly ingesting 40 to 50 pills. Where, where's the glass in at the death scene uh, for her having taken, you know, that with, with water, ingested that with water and all of that? And so that made me really wonder more about what had happened to Marilyn. And finally, I said, OK, what I need to know, what, what, what I know now is she was in good humor before she died. Mm-hmm. And there wasn't any indication of her being suicidal so what was going on in her love life just before she died? Mm-hmm. Well, who did that make me point toward? This is the only photograph ever taken of Marilyn Monroe, Bobby Kennedy, and John Kennedy together. This was May 29th, 1962. And most people, uh, at least of my age, will remember this is when Marilyn sang happy birthday on JFK's uh, birthday, a 45th birthday at Madison Square Garden. Uh, Dorothy Kilgallen wrote that it was like she made love to the audience because she had on this sequined uh, dress that was kind of see-through and everything. Mm -hmm. Third, I thought about, well, was she involved in Jack Kennedy, just with with Jack Kennedy, but right before she died? But I learned that that uh, love affair was short-lived because Joe Kennedy said, no, JFK, you can't keep going out with this celebrity. You're going to run for office. It won't work. And that immediately, George, sent me in the direction of Bobby Kennedy. Mm -hmm. What could I prove then about a relationship between them? Well, I struck gold right away with this journey that I was taking when I found the letter that we can put up on the screen right now. And this is a letter from Jean Kennedy Smith, the president's brother, uh, president's sister to Marilyn Monroe. We understand that you and Bobby are the new item, exclamation mark. We all hope that we all believe you should come back with him when he comes back east. This is the president's sister cementing the fact that there is a relationship between Bobby Kennedy and and uh, Marilyn Monroe then. And then I found a CIA document that was dated 
um, just a few days after, a uh, uh, day before Marilyn died, and it said the following, please put that up. Robert Kennedy has been having a, a romance and a sex affair over a period of time with Marilyn Monroe. Robert Kennedy was deeply involved emotionally with Marilyn and has repeatedly promised to divorce his wife to marry Marilyn. Eventually, Marilyn has realized that Bobby has no intention of going forward. I was able to prove that Bobby Kennedy was in Los Angeles, not San Francisco, as he said he was through uh, being able to uh, show through that his alibi didn't happen. And I can get into that in a minute. But basically, he was in L.A. the summer of 1962, uh, working on a movie about his book, The Enemy Within, which uh, just basically blasted all the mafia uh, alive and and really uh, caused uh, a lot of problems with them hating him so much uh, before JFK died. So he was there trying to get that uh, done, a movie. And I have evidence showing in the book that he visited Marilyn her home at Peter Lawford's beachfront home, all of that. And that relationship uh, had developed to the point where he had promised uh, Marilyn that he would uh, divorce uh, Ethel and marry her. Now, that sounds like could that have happened, but that was what it was in her mind. And then he dumped her, just like JFK had done, just dumped her. And I have this visual in the book that I'd like you to just think about. Here's Marilyn. She, she was dating the most powerful man in the world. Now she's dating uh, one of the most powerful people in the world, Bobby Kennedy, and she's sitting by the phone in her house, and she's calling the attorney general's office, and now he's not taking her calls, and and he's uh, basically just uh, dumping her like JFK did. Well, you can imagine the emotion of of her, the crying, the tears, all of that. Uh, This poor woman who, who Dorothy had written about that all she wanted was love in her life uh, is being dropped now by Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. So from there, we look at uh, Bobby Kennedy. Was he in L.A.? Uh, I found a, a ledger over at 20th Century Fox that basically said that, uh, 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 you know, that uh, Bobby Kennedy was in L.A. A helicopter landed on the day she died with Peter Lawford there. I had a Beverly Hills policeman who stopped the car with uh, Peter Lawford, Bobby Kennedy in the back seat and uh, Maryland psychiatrist in the front seat. Uh, at midnight on the day that uh, Marilyn died. And so all of that led me to really try to find another connection between the three subjects of my book. Mm-hmm. That was the first part of that CIA document that I told you about, if you just move forward some. It, I first thought it was an FBI. There's the two Kennedys together. Uh, I first thought that it was a, um, a document that, I'll, I'll talk about this one in just a second. But anyway, uh, well, let's go to this one. Okay, so... Just before uh, Marilyn died, the week before, I've been able to prove, and there's a, there's a book called The Hollywood Godfather by Gianni Russo. He was a, uh, a mafia runner for Frank Costello in New York. He was actually at this party at this, uh, this uh, lodge up on the California-Nevada border, and apparently Marilyn was there with the two Kennedys and ma- uh, mobster San Giancana and all of that, and Marilyn got the idea that they were going to pass her around sexually. She screamed and yelled and everything. And then she went back down to L.A. and she made the biggest mistake of her life. And that was to say that she was going to go to the media about uh, the love affairs with JFK and RFK. But there was one more thing that she was going to do. And if you'll see this CIA document, and I know you can't uh, you can't read it, uh, but basically what it says is that the subject is going to go to the media with everything she knows about the two love affairs. But then it is really uh, she actually signed her death warrant because she said uh, they, they put in here the subject has threatened to hold a press conference. But she also made reference to bases in Cuba and knew of the president's plan to kill Castro. Well, what did that mean? It meant that either was pillow talk or the Kennedys tried to impress her. They were giving her matters of national security, secrets of national security. Mm-hmm. And he would have gone to the media with that. It would have destroyed both of those men's lives. And so I was able then to connect that with a book that came out. If you'll go to the next uh, slide, I believe that's the copy of, uh, oh, this is, yeah, this is The Strange Death of Marilyn Monroe that was written at the time, about a year after Marilyn's death. And Frank Capel was the author, and he dictated what he believed was going on with, with, uh, with, um, with uh, Marilyn and uh, J- uh, with RFK and talking about his ruthlessness 
and that everybody knew about the affair and everything else like that. And that that book was a was a uh, a revelation to me because it really showed exactly what the relationship was and how Marilyn had been dumped and how she really felt like that now she was going to go to the media. Uh, so let's, one, one, yeah. one thing, Mark, yeah. um, you mentioned in your book that Frank Capel and his book, they, there's there's some question about some of the he was known for making accusations that didn't turn out to be accurate and stuff like that. So I think you should you should make that clear that that some of the accusations the CIA said he, aren't clear, but other things that he says were, were accurate. So that, that yeah, that's in the August 3rd, 1962 memo. Yeah. Some allegations of Capel are from public sources and are apparently true. Some are completely false. The other two extremely questionable and not subject to corroboration. But I want you to know in just a little bit. Well, I'll just tell you right now. OK, uh, basically, when this book came out and I have this in an FBI uh, memo mm. uh, there, they, they sent the book to Bobby Kennedy. Mm. They asked for his reaction. He wouldn't cooperate. They told him of the allegations in here that you've had this sexual relationship uh, you know, you, 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 you've been with her all summer and, and all of this, and you with her, uh, in LA and supposedly you and Peter Lawford went to her home to beg her not to go to the media and all that kind of thing. But what happened there? The FBI memo I have, and it's in the book basically states that FBI agents, as well as the Kennedys were, uh, ordered to go out and buy as many copies of the strange death of Marilyn Monroe. So nobody could read it. Mm-hmm. They were scared to death of this book, uh, George, and they couldn't let it get out into the media. And they basically just, uh, you know, uh, you know, s- suffocated the truth of what Capel had come up with, even if some of it was speculation in that book. They thought it was real. Mm-hmm. And that's the most important thing, I think, here. Right. Good. So if we can, then let's move on to uh, I have other additional uh, information in the book uh, from the two FBI memos that, that are in there. And you, there was a, a, a an article that I found in a, of all places, a photo play magazine by a woman named Martha Donaldson, who uh, interviewed a lot of uh, Maryland's uh, friends and all that kind of thing. And I just want to give you an idea of, of what that, uh, that article said. One year later, Marilyn Monroe's killer still at large. See if you can guess who she's talking about. You can see him in a crowd. You can reach out and touch him because he's a great man, famous, known all over the world. And maybe that touch will give you at least a small part of him. You can see him on television, even in a movie theater, or you, and you will be looked at him and think how lucky his wife is to be married and how lucky his many children are to have him as a father, many children. And maybe you'll think, I wish, her his, I, wish I was her, his wife. You can read about him almost any day in the newspaper and magazines, and you will think this is a good person, a truly honorable man. But what you will never read, never, never know, is that this man is a killer. He is the man who killed Marilyn Monroe Mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways, including all the other evidence I had found. There's no question in my mind that she was talking about Bobby Kennedy. And in fact, there's one more piece of evidence that comes into play. When uh, Greenson, uh, Dorothy's psychiatrist, was asked about who killed Marilyn Monroe, the only thing he said is, go ask Bobby Kennedy. So what happened after this? Well, in the book, I've given what I think is a plausible way that Marilyn Monroe was murdered. She did not ingest those pills. Uh, They were given to her in another way. There were clues that I found in the autopsy about the actions of her housekeeper when the police came and found found her body. Uh, there were questions about a an injury to her to her uh, hip that I found out uh, in the in the uh, autopsy, and those three clues give me what I think is the plausible way that Marilyn Monroe was killed by Bobby Kennedy's operatives. He had the greatest motive to have killed her, who came to her home on the night she died and poisoned her with barbiturates. And I'll leave you to read what my conclusion is, and you can make up your own mind. Mm-hmm. So, how did this all close out? There's the 20th Century Fox ledger, uh, Bobby's friend as police chief of L.A. Did they investigate Marilyn's death? They didn't investigate the death, just like they didn't investigate Dorothy Kilgallen's death. Another similarity in there. Mm-hmm. What, did William, uh, what did William Parker do? He appointed three psychiatrists. They, they never went to the death scene. They never interviewed witnesses. They appointed three psychiatrists to present in a panel discussion Marilyn's state of mind. And mm-hmm. what do you think? came back with well that she was suicidal absolutely absurd and that was the end of end of the case 
until I came along. Mm -hmm. If you keep going with this uh, a little further, quite a bit further, I want to get to the conclusion that I that I come up okay, with. Great. Neither one of these two women should have died. That's right. He shouldn't, uh, and I, Maryland shouldn't. I just want everyone to see L.A. Police Chief William Parker. There he who, is. Who was a there uh, he is the cover up in, guy in a fight with uh, Hoover, according to you. I thought if they make yeah. a movie out of your book, Tom Hanks has to play him. Look at that. Oh, you're right there. It looks, okay, so go uh, ahead. I don't know if he'd want if he'd want to, but anyway, so just keep going, and then you'll get to this conclusion that I reach. And I, I'm yeah. going to go through this a, a little bit uh, in a in a, in a you know with, without hurrying because I believe that this is the conclusion that I've come up with, and I think it makes sense. And I want to see what the audience to the book says. Mm-hmm. If Robert F. Kennedy had been prosecuted for complicity in Marilyn Monroe's murder in 1962, based on compelling evidence at the time, which I provided not only in the book, but also in a letter to the LADA, George Gaston, asking him to uh, to reinvestigate Marilyn's death, that uh, letter and uh, 300 pages of evidence, and the book was was delivered to him a week ago. Mm -hmm. He had been prosecuted. He would have been rendered powerless because he would have had to have defended himself There would have been no JFK assassination in 1963 since those who killed the president to make Bobby powerless would have had no motive to do so. And then further, Dorothy Kilgallen would not have been murdered in 1965 since there would have been no JFK assassination to investigate since her getting too close to the truth was why she was silenced, changing the course of history. Bottom line. The murders of Marilyn Monroe, JFK, and Dorothy Kilgallen were collateral damage based on the abuse of power by Robert Kennedy in 1961 and 1962. And hopefully my research will correct distortions of history today all about Marilyn, the ones at the Sixth Floor Museum at Daly Plaza, which are ridiculous about the Oswald alone theory. So that's my contribution to history, trying to say that basically, you know, and and the other advantage I had here, George, just Mm -hmm. to finish is yeah. I've done most everything in my life ass backwards. <laughs> and, and so that's what I, I did here. Normally, you would investigate Marilyn Monroe's death first, right? 1962, right. then uh, JFK, 63, then Mer- uh, then uh, uh, Dorothy, 65. Well, I investigated JFK's death first, then Dorothy's, and then Marilyn's. Mm-hmm. By doing so, I remember the day when I woke up in the middle of the night and said, oh, my God, this all makes sense. This opens a window to not only what happened to Maryland, but to all three deaths. And hopefully that's going to be the information that people can read in the book, make up their own mind and everything. But there should never have been a JFK assassination. There should never have been the the death of Dorothy Kilgallen. And for certain, there should never have been uh, the death of Marilyn Monroe, except for that, the actions by Bobby Kennedy. That's good. Now, we're going to back up just a little bit so that people who aren't familiar with some of your earlier books understand what you're, you're saying here, uh, too. Because what you're saying is, uh, and you did in the other books, is that Dorothy Kilgallen was tracking down Jack Ruby's story. Got, to, uh, got a special interview with him, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was clear to her that it was connected to a mob boss in New Orleans uh, named right. Marcello. Um, mm-hmm. And so it was... Um, it's saying that the JFK assassination was a mob hit. Um, and therefore, the mob was mad, but the mob was mad because Joe Kennedy had promised the mob that, right. that his sons would lay Good. off them. Good. Good. Thank you. It, it, yeah. So uh, why don't we tell, just, just with the two sentences or three sentences to give that background so that, so that people understand what led to what. Well, when the 60 election happened, Joe Kennedy knew they were going to lose. They called in, if they didn't win West Virginia and Illinois, so he called in some of his uh, underworld guys he knew from his book bootlegging days mm-hmm. and uh so uh you know they helped him win but the deal was the devil was we won't come after you if you help us uh when we get in the white house immediately joe and i had a witness right there uh in uh, in uh, the reporter who knew too much who was right there when uh joe ordered jfk to appo- appoint bobby kennedy bobby kennedy went after those guys especially marcello who said as the end of 1963 was coming after he had been deported once and he had been charged with racketeering, I can't let this happen. I've got to render Bobby Kennedy powerless. But if I kill him, JFK will come after me with everything the government has. But if I kill JFK, Bobby Kennedy will be powerless. And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And then stretch that on into the situation 
with Marilyn Monroe's death because if, in fact, he had been prosecuted, there would have been no JFK assassination because his enemies wouldn't have had to go after him because he was power. He would have been powerless. Yeah. It all connects. Yeah, you you, you draw in J. Edgar Hoover uh, to the to the whole story too, and and uh, he plays a very complex role in your in your uh, story as to. I mean, he and Bobby Kennedy did not get along at all, but you still think he would have had uh, Bobby's back in this thing. So, Well, I don't know if, in, as far as Marilyn went, but, you know, Dorothy Kilgallen was a smart woman. She said just before she died, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassin, assassination, it would cost me my life. I'm afraid for my life. Uh, I'm getting from my family and I'm getting a gun. She had pieced together Carlos Marcello, Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. And I will tell you that in the book, again, this Gianni Russo, who I mentioned before with his book, The Hollywood Godfather, uh, it really does uh, fill a hole in all of this because he has a, a, an on-scene account of being at Marcello's uh, restaurant in New Orleans and seeing Lee, Har- and see Lee, seeing Lee Harvey Oswald right there. Mm-hmm. And, and that all connects with what Dorothy, with the things that Dorothy had. The most fun with regard to this book was having the three books published, then getting into Maryland's story and seeing all the connections in there. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, George. I'm not the best researcher who ever lived. Mm-hmm. All this was hiding in plain sight. And I'll tell you today, when people le- read this book, they'll probably say, oh, Mark, leave the Kennedys alone. Mm-hmm. Well, the Kennedys were bad people in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of respect for Bobby Kennedy. He probably saved us from a nuclear war with the with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, JFK with civil rights, but they were womanizers. They used people. Hell, I had a I have a witness in the book who knew the Kennedys before when Jack Kennedy was a senator. He told me the Kennedys used to go into restaurants and have dinner and then just walk out and never even pay for it. Mm-hmm. They were they were privileged people. They're like some of the athletes today. They don't play by the rules. Mm-hmm. And and Bobby Kennedy and Jack and and uh, Joe Kennedy's. Uh, actions in 1961 and 1962 are responsible for three deaths. Let's talk about that a little bit, you know, the, the, the modern version of looking at this. Dorothy Kilgallen was a reporter. Marilyn was an actress. Sounds a lot like the Harvey Weinstein stories and the other things that have been going on with the Me Too movement. Um, and I was wondering if... if uh, it, well, you have in your book that Dorothy Kilgallen had a feud going with, with Frank Sinatra. They, Frank Sinatra would make fun of her and so on. And when asked why that was, what did she say? She said that uh, she turned him down. And turned I assume, she meant, right. I believe she meant down, turned, down, turned him down sexually. Right. And so, he, you know, he said terrible things about her yeah. at her, uh, with her looks, a double chin, uh, if you see and see if you run into Marilyn, do it with a or run into Dorothy, do it with a bus. I mean, yes, they they yeah. they became bitter enemies after they had been friends at one point. Yeah. So uh, it, it it sounds very much like, uh, well, one thing, Dorothy was a very uh, strong willed woman. And so she was willing to stand up to people even like Frank Sinatra. But it was yeah. interesting to me that if you if you had more female reporters, that you would have had much more pushback against the, the sort of what's called toxic male behavior uh, of, of the, the families who, who feel that this is the way to treat women. And um, it's interesting because if you, if you look at what she did as a reporter and trying to push back things, it might be an interesting study. I don't mean that that should be your next book, but <laughs> of, of how the number of female reporters increased and increased and increased until... There was a critical mass, and then the Me Too movement uh, took place because it really was powered by a very large number of, of uh, reporters and TV uh, announcers, female TV announcers, finally taking down uh, the men that had been the bane of their life, uh, of their professional lives. So well, Dorothy, was, know, Dorothy uh, was, a, was a front runner of all that. Well, you know, both of these women, Marilyn and Dorothy, uh, overcame gender discrimination. Mm-hmm. They overcame lack of education. Uh, Dorothy was a college dropout. But Marilyn never even got through high school. Mm. They had to deal, you know, back then, uh, women weren't supposed to be in the back of the car. They were, back of the car, they were supposed to be in the next car behind. Mm-hmm. Overcame all of that. But Dorothy, yes, uh, you know, with, with Sinatra and with others, you know, I'm sure she could have advanced further with her career when she began if she'd have slept with everybody. Mm-hmm. Marilyn was known to have, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know, acquiesced to having sexual affairs with uh, 
with uh, those uh, producers in Hollywood and so on and so forth. We don't know exactly what happened, but we can imagine at that time, just as, as bad as it was with Weinstein or whatever, and just as bad as I'm sure it is today, mm-hmm. for women to get ahead in that situation. I have no doubt that if, Mer- if uh, Dorothy Kilgallen would have been a man and, Dor- and Marilyn Monroe would have been a, a man, those deaths would have been investigated. Mm-hmm. So another way you can look at this that neither one of them, I mean, basically, you know, I have this uh, quote uh, on my writing desk. Uh, the dead cannot cry out for justice. It is the duty of the living to do that for them. And that's me. Hopefully in my book about Dorothy and Marilyn here, I'm their voice. I'm trying to scream, hell, they didn't get uh, justice when they died. Let's give them some today. Fortunately, I do think the NYPD cold case squad, at least they've told me they're going to look into Dorothy's death. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm hoping that the LADA will look into Maryland's death, but that's an uphill climb, as you know, George. Yeah, a very uphill climb. Um, one of the things you just mentioned about uh, screaming out for the justice for Dorothy, I mean, that's what, what you did uh, with your book on her before the reporter who knew too much. Um, you mentioned in, in, in just, I think it's page 544, if I remember correctly. <laughs> You mentioned that this author, you know, often, you know, uh, often sees things through Dorothy's eyes. And, and you, you mention a lot in the end when you're trying to put it together. Dorothy Kilgallen would have looked at it this way. Dorothy Kilgallen would have looked at it this way. Is there another element of your, your research that you want to share with us about this relationship you have with Dorothy and trying to see it through her eyes? Well, George, you have to recognize your um, the things you don't do well. Again, small town in Indiana guy, mm-hmm. uh, nearly never got per- through Purdue, almost flunked out of law school. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not the smartest guy who ever lived, but I was a, a crack inve- a crack criminal defense lawyer. I handled almost all murder cases. I learned how to tell stories to juries and all of that. I try to do that in my books, lay out the evidence like a, you know, like a prosecutor and everything else. But uh, from the get go, I will tell you, and I don't know if people will think that I need some uh, mental help, but I think Dorothy Kilgallen chose me to write her story. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then basically erased from the face of the earth after she died in in 1965. Uh, As I went along, I kind of felt that she was uh, guiding me this way or that way or whatever. And I will tell you that the moment I started to think about looking into Marilyn's life and times and her death, I felt an urging from Dorothy. Yes, do that, because there's more here than that's ever been, um, you know, exposed about what happened back then. So uh, when you're not the smartest guy in the world, you try to emulate those people that were. And and Dorothy Kilgallen, as I say, there's there's no. Oh, my God, how many letters I've gotten. We wish we had a reporter like Dorothy Kilgallen today. Mm -hmm who has that kind of integrity. You know, Dorothy actually went out, George, and found the facts and then, you know, made her conclusions. Today, unfortunately, many in the media, and I'm sure they'll probably do that with this book as well, bashing it or whatever, they'll get a conclusion of some sort and then they'll try to fit facts to that, which, you know, is is just not the way you do it. You get your facts first that way. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have such respect for Dorothy. Well, one of the facts that you put in your book, uh, too, is that uh, Dorothy's family... Uh, was very reluctant to get involved. They were also afraid of whoever may have killed her. They mean, of course, the, there's a question about whether the family members believed in her suicide or didn't believe in her suicide, and it went back and forth. But those who didn't were too afraid, really, to step forward, too. Um, that, well, you, you would be, too, yeah. uh, I think, because Dorothy was a blabbermouth, just like Marilyn made a big mistake, George, by saying she was going to the media as and I get a chill every time I say this. When I told this story to a reputable witness who was there at the time, mm-hmm. uh, when I told him that Marilyn was going to the uh, media with uh, the uh, matters of national security and the love affairs, his comment was she was dead. Well, it was right. the same situation with Dorothy when she, uh, you know, when they knew that she was going to go ahead and uh, and report this uh, material about the JFK assassination in in a, in a book for Random House. And so then uh, I'm afraid for my life and my family, all of that. Well, she's then she's dead, found in a, a, a bedroom in her townhouse. She never slept in wearing her uh, false eyelashes, her hairpiece and her makeup like she was going out to a party. Mm-hmm. State death scene for, for sure. No investigation. And then, you know, uh, they, they, they tried to contact the family to cooperate then, just as I've done many times. But if you can imagine at that time, Anybody involved, the What's My Line panel, her friends, colleagues would have said to themselves, wait a minute, 
if uh, if uh, uh, you know Dorothy's working on the JFK assassination and those people that were involved killed her, well, they're going to come after us too if we do anything. Mm-hmm. And to this day, there's never been any cooperation with any investigation by them. I have a, a, a side question for a second. We'll get to questions from the audience in just a second. Um, after JFK's death, Jackie picked the myth of Camelot to try to enshrine the Kennedy years. And, and that's this Camelot uh, image of what that brief and shining moment was like. I'm wondering if she was, I mean, because she's a very clever woman, um, whether she was also pointing to the uh, disabling adultery that's at the center of the Camelot story as well. Because there's a book that I, yeah, there's a book that I quote in in my book. Uh, it's a, it's a biography of Rose Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you can find it in the find the book in in my book, and I'd suggest anybody that wants to know all about that because what did Rose Kennedy do? Well, she, Joe was running around with Gloria Swanson, his trophy, uh, his trophy, a girlfriend, his mistress, while he was married. Mm-hmm. Uh, F.K. had his trophy, uh, you know, uh, Jackie Kennedy. Uh, you know, uh, finally, uh, Bobby Kennedy has his trophy, uh, Marilyn Monroe. But Rose Kennedy talks about, uh, at least in the interviews that she did with, you know, with friends and the author and everything in that book, that, hey, you know, he was what he was, Joe was, and I just put up with it. Mm-hmm. Jack Kennedy had to have just turned her back on that. I feel a lot of sympathy for her and Rose and 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 all of those women who have these uh, serial adulterers. Mm-hmm. I mean, for sakes ethel had what 12 or 13 children Mm -hmm. bobby and he's out running around with Marilyn monroe and i could give you and i do in the book many more accounts of everybody knowing it went on Mm -hmm. so it's it's disturbing but yes uh i have a lot of sympathy for for jackie kennedy that she had to put up with that in the white house Mm -hmm. all right well we have some questions coming in from the audience so uh from uh, kieran brown uh, how does your narrative differ from Lamar Waldron's work? Are you familiar with Lamar Waldron's work? Yes. Okay. How, uh, how, what, in what way does your story differ from what he, he uh, concluded? Dorothy Kilgallen. You know, uh, yeah. there are all these books out there about the JFK assassination. There's only one or two that I give much credence to. Gerald Posner, Oswald, you know, Case Close, Vincent Bugliosi. Uh There was a novelist who was it uh, who just wrote a book about the Kennedys. You know, uh, I, I, I respect every opinion out there, hmm. but nobody's ever been able to, for whatever reason, I don't know why Lamar, Lamar didn't do this. I guess they just missed it, like everybody else did, that Dorothy Kilgallen was the most credible reporter. None of those authors I just talked about are, for God's sakes, uh, you know, uh, uh, JFK, the film, the, the uh, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone one, yeah. In Dallas, they weren't there. Uh, Dorothy Kilgallen was in the front row. I have the Ruby trial transcripts, 2,000 pages that I found of the Ruby trial transcripts, Mm -hmm. put them in denial of justice. I read every page, and I'll tell you right now, if you even look at a little excerpt from that, you find out that no question in those minds of the jurors was that there was a a plot to kill uh, JFK. You know why? Because Jack Kennedy is, excuse me, Jack Ruby is overheard during a telephone call saying on the day that he shot Oswald, I will be there when he's transferred. I will get help from my police buddies to get into the basement. I will act like a reporter uh, to get to the basement. He was stalking Oswald. There's no question about that. There was this plot to kill the president. I even think Melvin Belli may have been involved in it. So I'm, a, I, I'm appreciative of what Lamar wrote. A lot of the things he wrote make sense, but he didn't have what I had. And that was the advantage of looking at it through the eyes of uh, Dorothy Kilgallen. Yeah, and Dorothy, uh, as you said, she, she went right down there and then she sat through the trial. I mean, you, you also, yeah. you also uh, described Dorothy's life. Um, one, of, one of the questions here is, uh, you know, wow, I, I've always wondered what happened to Dorothy Kilgallen. This is fascinating. Um, it, you expressed what she lived like. She lived like a, you know, that was the jet setter. You know, I mean, jet setter is like, you couldn't have a more perfect... She was flying all over the country, flying back, doing her television show in New York, flying out to the trials. Uh, she must have spent a lot of money uh, doing that, but uh, obviously it was uh, paid for by somebody because uh-huh. she didn't get rich. But it's a fascinating how much she moved around all the time, and she must have had a tremendous amount of energy to keep this up. Why don't you tell a little bit about that? 
uh, about how, well, how you know, to live that. with Dorothy, for instance, uh, you know, I, I pride myself in the fact that the reason I get all these tips, and I'll bet I'll get some from this broadcast too. I got mm. yesterday. I, I was just telling you, I got a, a, a person who listened to a podcast yesterday who sent me a letter from from John Steinbeck mm. to Marilyn Monroe asking him to uh, asking her to send a photo uh, a, a, an autograph for a friend of a little boy friend of his yeah People, you know and there there's uh, dorothy with her uh, with carrie her her loving uh, she loved her youngest son and there is uh, jack kennedy with his family and the and by the way and i'll come back to this in a minute but at the end of the book i try to really humanize the three subjects of this book mm-hmm. what they lost and what we lost right uh, dorothy never got to play with her son again jack kennedy never got to play with the two kids uh, Marilyn, the only thing in the world she wanted was to have a baby. And she thought maybe after she got over the Robert Kennedy mess, she might remarry Joe DiMaggio. Mm-hmm. We lost. We lost a gr- one of the greatest entertainers of all time, one of the greatest reporters. We lost Jack Kennedy. But with, with Dorothy, uh, she, she, uh, my favorite, you know, favorite story is one that was brought to me by a 99-year-old woman uh-huh. who lives over in Oakland, California who told me that she used to see Dorothy at the hot spots in, in New York City, you know, uh, uh, the 21 Club and, and uh, all those kinds of places. And, and Dorothy would wave at her and everything. And then she would see, him, see her with celebrities and everything else like that. Uh, basically, Dorothy was a bigger story than the story she covered. Mm-hmm. At the Dr. Sam Shepard case, I have a TV guide uh, account of her at the trial and an interview there. And we could get into that more because basically she helped overturn the, the guilty verdict of, of Dr. Sam Shepard. But, uh, you know, they talk about her. Wa- oh, I'm, I'm sorry. They talk about her walking into the courtroom at uh, the Jack Ruby trial. And I have her at Daily Plaza photograph there. But they t- talk about her. Um, it was the ABC. It became the ABC uh, reporter. Uh, you know, anchor at the time, but he was at the Jack Ruby trial. And he talked about that when uh, uh, Dorothy walked in, the the courtroom stopped. Mm -hmm. I mean, here we are in one of the most, uh, you know, the the most, I don't know what you'd call it, the biggest trials in the world, Jack Ruby's. And Uh and he's sitting there and who's everybody looking at? They're looking at Dorothy Kilgallen as it should have been. And and as you, you said, I think even the judge wanted her autograph, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, he certainly so, did. <laughs> the the uh, w- w- let's get back to the family stuff in a, in a second. But it's fascinating um, that that Dorothy Kilgallen, in her approach to what she did, um, pushed. I mean, she she put so many different things together um, in terms of her her thing. She was on this What's My Line panel. Um, she was she had a television show with her husband. Um, I mean, a radio show with her husband show, yeah. that, that, that uh, was on all the time. Um, and, and then she did her uh, reporting. And her father was a reporter. That's how she got into that. So mm-hmm. she, and she was a famous reporter. She was a columnist. And she was a gossip columnist. Plus, she was a, a trial col- a columnist. You know, so she did, she did so many different things. Um, and I wanted to go back to the Sam Shepard trial because, as you, you mentioned very quickly, she was... Her research was responsible for him being proven not guilty and, and getting off. And uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that the Sam Shepard trial is the um, trial and the story that led to the story of The Fugitive, both the television show in the 60s and the Harrison Ford movie uh, later on about you know a doctor who was accused of murdering his wife. But right. It didn't turn out to be true, right? So, Yeah, let me, let me uh, explain that. And you know what you're talking about, George, this is all history. Yeah. And it should be distorted. And people may say, Mark, this, why is this relevant? It's 60 years ago or whatever. Well, it is relevant. Mm-hmm. And we only learn from history and all of that. But to show the integrity that Dorothy Kilgallen had, uh, she, she went to the, Jack, uh, the Dr. Sam Shepard case, sat right in the front row, got to know uh, Dr. Shepard. And uh, basically then, uh, before, during one uh, you know, uh, pause in the trial, she went back and met the judge. Uh, and he asked for her autograph. And then he told her something that she knew would cause problems with whatever happened in the trial. Mm -hmm. Well, she could have gone, she could have written about that and everything else, but basically she felt like he had told it to her in in confidence. Mm -hmm. She held on to that. And my former colleague, Lee Bailey, ended up representing uh, Dr. Sam Shepard. After the judge died, uh, Dorothy went to F. Lee Bailey and said, I have something you need to know. And he said, what? 
And she said, when I met with the judge, he said, well, what the hell are you doing here, Dorothy? This is this case is, uh, you know, uh, basically there's nothing to it. He's guilty as hell. Mm -hmm. What that became was the main part of an appeal to the Supreme Court because Dr. Shepard was found guilty of the murder of his wife. And the only reason that he saw freedom was because of what Dorothy Kilgallen had told F. Lee Bailey. And in the book, uh, I was contacted by Dr. Sam Shepard's son, Mm -hmm. Dorothy, all the credit uh, for the freedom that his that his father enjoyed after having been found guilty. So that's the integrity. She held on to that because she wasn't going to break that that confidence. You know, when Dorothy Kilgallen exposed the Jack Ruby testimony before the Warren Commission, before it was supposed to be exposed, George, as you know, right? F, uh, J. Edgar Hoover sent these two. I like to think these huge. Uh, F- <laughs> to her home. And here's a little Dorothy in the front uh, front room with no lawyer or anything. All right, where'd you get the the, um, the testimony uh, that, that Ruby came? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Mm. Uh, come on now, you, you know, this is a matter we need to know about. Well, I would rather die than mm. give my sources. That's Dorothy Kilgallen. That's the woman she was. And she should have never died in 1965. Think about what she would have accomplished if she had not uh, been killed in 65. Yeah, and I think uh, it's also, I mean, in, in spite of, I mean, people in our culture, if, if someone does something wrong, they, they're considered to be, you know, uh, completely bad uh, right now. Um, but uh, everyone kind of uh, recognizes that JFK, I mean, it's a, it's a well-known historical fact now that he was a serial womanizer. Um, but uh, his wife had a father who was like that as well, and uh, he, she considered him a good father to their children, Right. Yeah, I, and oh, I think yes. we could talk, and, talk about that. In addition to being a, a decent president and so on. Um, I, wish I, had it, yeah, I wish I had it in here, but there's a book that I found, and I use it at the end of my book. Uh, it was written, uh, the forward is by Caroline Kennedy, who, by the way, I've sent both of my previous books to, and I've already written a letter to her, and I'm sending a new one. Mm-hmm. I want her to know my research. Mm-hmm. Basically, I want her to know that if Bobby Kennedy would have been prosecuted in 1962, her father wouldn't have been killed in 1963. Mm-hmm. There's a book uh, that Caroline Kennedy uh, wrote the forward to. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger interviewed Jackie Kennedy, I think it's a few months after JFK died. And that's a book that's out there. And it's really important. And I, and I uh, quoted from it because it talked about how JFK was with his kids, that he would play with them before he went to the White House. We know of the photographs of John, John and Caroline in the office and that one little cute one of J- John John under the desk and all of that. But he was a, he was a great father to them. You know, Dorothy Kilgallen, I, I tried to tell uh, the uh, NYPD cold case squad guy when I met him uh, or when I talked to him, Sergeant Panzarella, Philip Panzarella, who contacted me about the fact he was going to look into Dorothy's death, that she was the mother of three children. Sure, she was this big celebrity. Sure, Marilyn was a big celebrity. But all she wanted to be was a mother. These were human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think really, if they all hadn't had the celebrity, they probably would have gotten the justice they deserved when they died. Yeah. And here's a couple of pictures of Marilyn. Uh, You you tell a great story about how uh, Joe DiMaggio Jr., who was, I I assume, her stepson, uh, um, and that they got a little girl there, et cetera, et cetera. And And I don't know if we have time, but I'd love to tell you one more story about Marilyn. Yeah. Tell us another story about Marilyn. Absolutely. Well, many of your, your listeners or your viewers may remember uh, Ethel Merman, who right. was the famous uh, Broadway star. Well, her son, Bob Levitt, uh, and I will tell you right now, he got in touch with me because he had watched one of my uh, presentations up on YouTube, one that I gave at the Allen Library down near Dallas. And he said, I have some information for you. My sister and I were really good friends of uh, Dorothy and her husband and their kids in New York City. We used to go over there and play and all this other kind of stuff. And in fact, when our uh, Tweety bird ran, uh, flew out the window and was lost into New York City, we had Dorothy announce it on her uh, Breakfast with Dorothy and Dick radio program. And for God's sake, somebody found our Tweety bird and brought it home. But the yeah. one that really got me was that he was uh, on the set of um, uh Gen- uh, of uh, there's no sh- uh, no business like show business, which was one of Marilyn's biggest roles. If you if you don't watch anything that she was ever in, go watch that. The dancing, the singing, the, the you know when Marilyn came on the screen, there was nobody else on the screen. That beauty and everything. Mm-hmm. Well, he 
you know, he was 10 years old and he sat there and he and Marilyn became friends. And at the same time, there was a, another film on another set and it had something to do with uh, Sir Lancelot or whatever. And there was a sword, a play sword. And he had it and Marilyn made the biggest fuss over it. And they played with it, all these other kind of things. And he said she was the most gracious uh, motion picture star or woman I ever knew. And he obviously would have met a lot of them through Ethel Merman. Mm -hmm. And it just warmed my heart because that's who she was. She was a loving woman. She had just gotten a dog. She had just owned the first home in her life. Everything was going forward. She had been offered a Broadway play uh, to, to, to star in. And she'd always wanted that. All she wanted was to have a baby and be recognized as a, as a, uh, as a uh, legitimate uh, actress. And then she fell into the nest of the Kennedys, and that ended her life. One of the great things about that story about Ethel Merman's son that I thought was, he even mentions that his own mother and her friends were all um, backbiting uh, about Marilyn, but he didn't believe it. So he didn't believe his mother or the other people. He, he believed his own perception of Marilyn uh, as, as this nice motherly figure for him. And yeah, that's a primary source. See, yeah. it's right. And that's what I, I like to do. This book is not my opinions. This is not my my saying all this happened. It's based on the documents and the photographs and the and the first uh, you know first witness accounts of everything that happened. I mean, just like with Dorothy, she was right there mm. at the, the Ruby trial. Uh, all these other people, they have to speculate. I don't do that. So I have uh, there's two more uh, questions in, and then we'll we'll uh, bring this to an end. So uh, there's a comment from Bethany Green. Uh, who says, I would lay the responsibility on way beyond the Kennedys alone. They're all connected, and the CIA had absolutely no oversight zip. So uh, she makes that comment. I have another one. It seems to me that if the CIA, which your memos show, was completely aware of JFK's connections with the mob, um, and you haven't mentioned this, but it's also a well-known fact. Uh, you put it in your book. But he shared a, a, a mistress with, with uh, one of the mob uh, bosses as well. And you'd think that the CIA might be concerned that the president was selling out the country to, to the criminal elements in some way that he was. Uh, so, so I think their concern about what JFK was up to and everything seems legitimate under the circumstances. Uh, As I understand it, uh, and I wouldn't trust him with anything in my life, but that was J. Edgar Hoover, who apparently went to uh, Joe Kennedy and, and, uh, and told him, he said, you know, this has got to stop with regard to what JFK is doing with the womanizing ah. and, everything else. And, and he may be, you know, giving secrets away and all that kind of stuff. And apparently Joe, uh, apparently, uh, you know, JFK listened, but Bobby Kennedy never listened to his father. Yeah. You talk about the apple dropping from the tree, uh, <laughs> one quote, one quote of, uh, Joe Kennedy's Bobby Kennedy hates just as much as I do. And, and, you know, Joe Kennedy had all the money and the power and everything. And in the book, I compare him to some other uh, figures of, of, of like uh, that had personality disorders and things like that, that I think, you know, he basically was so upset that he couldn't run for president that he lived. And I have a quote from in the Rose Kennedy book. You know, he lived through his children mm -hmm. and, and thing went there. There were no morals in Joe in Joe Kennedy. So there were no morals in in JFK and even no and even worse morals in Bobby Kennedy. But, but what in the world could you expect? When, when JFK died and they told Joe Kennedy he was in a bed, he'd been, you know, he had the stroke and all that. And apparently from what the, the recollection is of Ted Kennedy, who told him, he threw the New York Times on the floor and keeled over because he knew, he knew that he was responsible mm. through Bobby Kennedy for the death of his beloved son, JFK. All right, we have uh, one last question, and it sums this up because uh, it's all about Marilyn. It's from Matt uh, MGM. Uh, so was Marilyn killed by drugs or was she murdered? <laughs> well, there's no question in my mind that she was silenced and that Bobby Kennedy is responsible for that silencing, for that murder. Hmm. Yes, drugs were used, barbiturates. Uh, we had a, we had a uh, side that I didn't use. There, there was a drug, chloral hydrate, uh, nembutol, uh, which phenobarbital, nembutol, whatever, you know, these drugs were uh, inflicted into Marilyn's uh, body. I don't want to give away the, yeah. the thing and, and the, the methods yeah. that I have. I want people to make up their own mind with my conclusions, but they were not ingested. I will tell you that that didn't happen. 
and, and they weren't injected. So you can use your imagination as to how else this could have occurred. But I think I give a pretty good plausible explanation as to the means by which Marilyn died. And then, you know, these clues that I had about uh, what the police found when they got there and the injury to her hip and other things that obviously uh, there was violence involved in her death. You know, I think I love the way you laid out the research because you, you, you make it clear what you know, what you don't know, and what the possibilities are and what, what might not be, what might have happened, what might not have happened. But I think it's perfectly clear that whether they were directly involved, the way they lived their life created this collateral damage, as you called it. You know, that the way the Kennedys lived their life it was very great Gatsby. And it's, and it's interesting because their father was compared to Jay Gatsby, uh, you know, yes. when he was when he was successful, um, and the novel was already out, and he was so similar in, in the bootlegging and then becoming rich and famous, etc., that the sons lived out their life in 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 a similar careless way, like Fitzgerald says, you know, the, these these careless people who just keep moving on, and and in their wake, there's a lot of destruction that they don't even pay any attention to and just move on. Well, and I, I think how you regardless about, of how directly yeah. involved they were or not involved, that was, that's sort of inescapable. Right. I don't know how you feel or your audience will feel about everything comes around. But if you want to take collateral damage to, to another level, look at the tragedies in the Kennedy family's lives. Mm-hmm. You know, Joe Kennedy, killed in the, in the, Joe Kennedy Jr. killed in the war. And then you keep going down with JFK Jr. being killed. And, and uh, you know, all of the tragedies uh, all the way up to... Uh, last year, they call it the Kennedy curse. But if you if you saw, I think a year ago, uh, one of the uh, uh, nephews or something, or one of the nieces and a little uh, child died in the Chesapeake. Mm-hmm. It, it just kept going on for that family uh, in terms of all the, stra- the tragedies that there that there were. Uh, Ted Kennedy, for God's sakes, the whole thing with Chappaquiddick and and basically being responsible for Kopechny's death. I mean, you can just look at all that, and if and if we believe that, that things come around. Uh, by our actions, then uh, the collateral damage not only killed these three people, but has caused all of those tragedies in the Kennedy family. Yeah. Fascinating to talk to you again, as always. Um, another great research job. Um, Thank you. And we look forward to the next one, although I'm not sure you are from what you said about this one. <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, George, it's a pleasure to be on here. And obviously, as you know, I have great respect for you. So Quite an honor for me. Thanks, thanks for having me back at the Commonwealth Club. It was, it was a great pleasure again. So ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion in San Francisco. We hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for joining us.